All right, so this game is one of my favorite games. Legend of the Five Rings, the card game. It's been around since 1995, and it recently, uh, it kind of died out in 2015. It has a new version. Back when this thing existed, there was a lot of news going around of how terrible a card game it was. Hilarious that I say that because I'm willing to bet the people who said that may have been heavily invested in certain other card games. The thing is, Legend of Five Rings, it was not designed to be like the most accessible card game in the world. And it also wasn't based on the same premises other card games were. It's kind of a civilization game, or it used to be a civilization game. So I'm going to be trying out the new living card game here relatively shortly. And I'll even be comparing and contrasting the two. Let me explain a few things. This is a deck box from the original game, um, which is interesting because in the original game you needed the box to play the game. This is your stronghold. One thing that no other card game had is a starting value that, mind you, this is 1995. Magic the Gathering is two and a half years old at this point when this game is released. So keep that in mind. The Stronghold, and this is, I, I just pulled random stuff out of my collection. I'm not even, by the way, I'm not going to be using established decks of mine. All of this is just junk that was laying around my collection that I recombobulated into a deck. That's why you're seeing a Unicorn Clan deck here. Um, I'm not a Unicorn Clan player at all. I had one just laying around. Um, so I'm going to explain a few things. You have a, a province strength value, you have a, a starting gold value, an honor value, you have a special ability. What really matters is this gives you something no other card game, game gives you at the time. You start off with a certain amount of resources no matter what. You don't, have, you don't have to worry about drawing and playing mana. There are two decks you have in Legend of the Five Rings. It sounds like it suddenly becomes more complicated, but actually it does something really interesting. A dis division between your dynasty deck, your dynasty deck is best thought of as like your creatures and your mana, if you want to talk about it from Legend, uh, Magic the Gathering uh, aspects. So the stuff that's kind of like the core of your game generates out of your dynasty deck. This is also true in the new game. The new game has both a dynasty deck and a fate deck too. By the way, here's the fate deck. But the, uh, they, they call them somewhat different. We'll go into that later. This is like your your interrupts, your, your special buffs, your enchantments. These are your tuning and um, reaction style cards. When you play a game of Legend of Five Rings, let me see if I can get this right upside down, you switch out the two decks like this. So you have the decks on either side of your play area, and you make space for four cards that come from your Dynasty deck like this. Now one thing this also is preserved in the new L5R game, by the way. I figured that much out. I haven't played it yet, but I'm going to, and I'm going to, I know what the, the similarities are. So in Legend of the Five Rings, keep in mind, from the Dynasty deck, you suddenly have four cards that represent not two different things. They represent two things. They represent your life, and you can draw them. You usually have, like, what, seven cards in your hand in most other collectible card games? Uh, this is four. We have five in Legend of the Five Rings because the fate cards, but your decks are usually 30 and 30. I usually build mine, 30 minimum is good here. This can be 30 or more. This deck itself is 37 cards over here. But anyway, so you have this card, your cards in your hand you drew, and but that's one thing. Each turn, you have the option to flip each of these cards and decide what you want to do with each of these cards. Yeah, I didn't shuffle the deck. Like I said, I was just put something together today. So you just, at each turn, you technically have five cards or more in your hand. You can draw four more cards from your dynasty deck. And you start out with resources. So yeah, you can, if you pull something big and nasty here, you probably should throw it away and draw something else. You can do that. You're like, I don't need two of these. Actually, it's kind of a lie. Um, I don't need two of him, and so you can throw him away and replace him with a card. This gives you the freedom to flow through your actual deck that perpetuates the game. Your creatures, your mana, all moves faster and gets into play faster because of this. Plus, you start off with a stronghold. So, 
Let me also point something out. The only cards required to play the game are these cards. Um, holding cards, which represent, they can represent fortifications, but they're uh, pretty much your gold producers, and they often have special abilities or give you bonus gold if you belong to a specific clan. That's another thing. There's no color of mana. It's all just gold, like an economy. Then you have your personalities, which you, this is what an unaligned personality looks like. This is Sanzo, the cheapest cavalry personality ever. There's Sanzo. I think it's Imperial Edition, too. But yeah, he has a force value and a chi value. Not like the new game where you have a political and military value. This one represents how burly you are versus how precise and spiritual you are. And then, of course, it has a gold value, how much honor it takes to bring him into play without penalty, and how much honor he brings uh, himself into the game. Honor is kind of like your political stat in the old L5R game. And, of course, they all have special abilities. But the thing is, is that, besides explaining the cards, there are other types of cards in Legend of the Five Rings. You're only beholden to use holdings and personalities. And it's a very, very, very good idea to use action cards, which is what these are. Let me, this is one of the best actions ever. I love this card. If you play L5R and you don't love this card, you must have an extremely strange play style. This is one of the best cards ever. Anyway... I only have one in the deck. I didn't have too many slaying around. Um, so this is the thing about Legend of the Five Rings, is that it's designed after Magic the Gathering and has an improvement over just drawing one card per turn off of a 60-card deck. Yeah, there's cards in Magic that allow you to draw more. Like, I always played with, like, a Howling Mine in play when I played Magic the Gathering, so I could get cards quicker. Um, this this game does that automatically. You have four provinces you draw your creature type guys from, and your hand is just a reaction adjustment. Like, if you're having a defensive stick, you can play that. If you need to recover quickly from a battle, you can play that. If you have a sudden need to really put pressure on your enemy when you have more troops than he does, you can drop that. Um, but the thing is, is that Legend of the Five Rings is different than other card games. It's not more complicated. The extra card types can make them complicated. And so that may have gotten people thrown off. And of course, they were probably told this by like people who were really heavily invested in some other card game and were shilling their card game instead. Let me show you the other card types you find in Legend of the Five Rings. In your Dynasty deck, you have events. Now, when they pop up, they're, they're events, you know. When they pop up, you play them and then you throw them away. They go into your discard pile. You have one on this side and one on this side, by the way, just letting you know. Which reminds me, why did I throw this over there? I should go over here. Anyway, so you have that. And then this is a fortification. It's just a holding that has no gold-producing abilities. They stick to the province you bring them in play from, and they defend that province because they're a fortification. So there's that. This is a river region. It is a region. <laughs> and they work almost the same way that fortifications do. And they work the same way events do. When they show up in a province, they happen, and they attach to the province they come from. That simple. Um, none of the mechanics in L5R that were base mechanics were really stupid. A lot of them, as long as you were paying attention and it could understand a sentence or two, you could get how to play that kind of card. Um, other kind of items you get out of your deck besides uh, the... Um, action cards I was showing earlier. I think the bottom will bring us one of these. Yep. This is a follower. It's essentially a troop unit. It, they'll have no chi. They, or they might give you a bonus of chi, but still. They'll have a force value, they have a gold value. The honor here has to match or exceed on the personality that attaches these. These attach. They're like, they're like enchantments. But what they really are is they're troops that follow him around. See? You can gets followed around by heavy cavalry now. Isn't it really cool? But yeah, then you have, if you like magic, these are the spell cards for Shigenja. This is the Winds of Change. Yay. Um, they literally do the same things. They usually attach to a personality and give them a new special ability. It's literally all it is. You attach it and add a new special ability. This is an item. It's usually a buff card. They often have special abilities too, but notice how it has that plus two chi in the corner. That's actually a really good thing. In L original L5R, you didn't ever ignore your chi stat because people could screw with it, and you needed it to survive or do certain things. So, in any case, there's that. This is the um, an action card. It looks different. Notice how it has this spell-like uh, title and text on the bottom, but it's an action-colored thing. It's a keyhole. These are definitely not required. They're often just play off of monks 
or if you have Shigenja you don't care about attaching spells to. They usually cost no gold, and they're an action. You play off of a monk or Shigenja personality. A Shigenja, by the way, is the, uh, the L5R term for a wizard. More like a cleric, really, but still, we will call them wizards for now. And there's this. This is the controversy, because you do not need these cards to play the game. There's a reason it's called Legend of the Five Rings, because you don't need them. They're a legendary ability that you may not want to use. They were not, I think they were always like uncommon or rare also. And some of them had, they changed the way they wrote the text and the rules required to play these cards all the time. People who want to screw over new L5R players will emphasize how important these cards are. You don't need to play them at all. It's literally not required. So, um, yeah, it's, that's why it's called Legend of the Five Rings. You don't need the, the rings, but they're cool, but you have to pull off certain effects to play them. I'm going to show you what's actually in this little deck I constructed, simple as it is. It follows that premise I said earlier. This is a workable, usable deck. Um, honestly speaking, I don't have enough good stuff in my collection to make it a great deck, but it's a good one. And it has just personalities and just holdings as far as this site is concerned. I could throw in some regions to make it really effective, but I wanted to show what I was saying earlier. Um, I have, first of all, the basis is the holdings. The stronghold, this thing produces five gold at the start of the game and throughout the game. However, um, we backed it up with the stables that produce three gold if they're unicorn clan based, and jade works, which produce three gold or five gold if you're doing a jade item, but we're going to just forget about that. They cost three gold, they make three gold. It's an investment. Um, now this we usually, we could usually run a deck that's about 37 cards off of 12 holdings if you really want to, but I decided to throw in two extra. Um, the silver mines are just a basic, they have a horse on them, so I included them. <laughs> They're a uh, two gold cost, they make two gold, unless you're a phoenix clan, in which case they make three. But I just needed to have something that created gold. This Sanctified Temple creates gold, too. It'll bow for two gold, or it'll bow to create two honor if you're paying for two gold. So I included the silver mines to back up the Sanctified Temple, so my big gold producers and my strongholds can pay for really important stuff if I need to pay for honor. Now, I also included two Bushi Dojos in there. They do nothing unless you're paying for a follower. My Fate deck is composed of actions and followers, so I'm going to show you that here in a bit. But this, um, it's structured just a certain way. Um, I just pretty much took uh, all the cards I had and said, could I make a Unicorn Clan deck off of this? Um, these two guys are anti-range attack, so if you want to keep uh, heavy cavalry around, you can stick them on this guy. He's immune to range attacks, and he redirects range attacks to him. So that's a good thing. Uh, these two guys' are special abilities... Actually, no, these two guys' special abilities you can pretty much ignore because everything in a Unicorn Clan deck is cavalry-based, including the guys that I brought in from foreign clans. Um, this guy does have a thing where if he can hunt down infantry, or if infantry try to leave the battlefield, he prevents them from leaving the battlefield. That's good. He's just a, he's one of the standards of uh, the old Unicorn Clan decks, Shinjo Hanari. That and Hidasuru here is actually his uh, opponent, his uh, rival. So I included him just for the fun of it. They cost the same. He's a little bit uh, not as potent, but he reduces the cost of followers being attached to him, which is great because cavalry followers are expensive. Um, that's also why we have a cheap Sanzo here. We don't have to bow the stronghold to bring him into play. If we already brought into play a Jade Works or a Stables, he can bow to make the three gold necessary to bring Sanzo the cheap into play. This is uh, just an experienced card I threw in because it's there. It looks cool. But uh, this is the Dynasty side of the deck. It's mostly just personalities. I'm going to turn them to play. The Unicorn Clan relies heavily on cavalry as a mechanic. And so here we have uh, a deck that pretty much just reinforces bring out more cavalry personalities. And the average personality's strength in this deck is two. So it's not going to be very impressive as far as that's concerned, but we have a way to get around that. The Champion, which is funny, this is actually an uncommon card that came from Scorpion Clan Coup. Everybody has one. I think I have a few of these laying around, but he's unique. You can only use one. He gives plus one force to all the other personalities in his army, so if he's attacking with other people, their twos can become threes. She gets a plus one force if she's attacking. Um, he gets plus one force if defending. 
yada yada, so on and so on. Besides, I have action cards and I have uh, followers that are gonna make that more impressive anyway. So, and here you see the fate side, the fate deck side of the deck build is just followers and action cards. The, uh, the followers are there to contribute force to the units that didn't have too much force earlier. You saw the average one had a, a strength of two. Um, we have medium cavalry that has a strength of two, heavy cavalry with a strength of four. I swore I had three of them. The third one would be very, very nice actually in this deck. Considering I have the Bushi Dojos that pay for followers, that's eight gold there, that'll contribute six, so this is pretty much on the way. Um, I also included Cavalry Raiders, I had two of those laying around, and two Horse Bowmen laying around. These are both ranged attack, so they can do the archers uh, shooting at the enemy while the personality is not occupied with their own shooting. I also have some scouts, because scouts are great. Scouts allow you to play terrains before the enemy can, which is a very good thing to do in this. I have defensive terrains. I have, anybody can use these terrains. They just give a plus one bonus to whichever side plays it. Um, that, there's a card I have on the other, uh, in the, de in the uh, Dynasty deck that allows you to take control of an enemy's terrain. I like that. Blocks of pylons removes an enemy unit from the battlefield, which is good. Superior Tactics rem either removes the, uh, it removes a terrain in play, or it allows you to uh, move back and forth. Basic charge for attack bonus. Um, I have standing against the waves, which helps essentially if I have followers and they don't, I can crush them a little bit. And so, congratulations, here we are. Rally troops also allows me to recover from dying personalities. We can take the followers over from the dying guy to the living guy. And I wish I had more rallying cries. I would drop the charges for more rallying cries. And I really, I swore I had a third heavy cavalry. But yeah, this is the fate side. It's very simple. You just put these attached to personalities that have the cavalry trait, and congratulations, you have a cavalry unit. And these actions help you fight in battles. It's very simple, and there's nothing confusing about it. You get your forces on the field, and you go. That is the simplicity behind the complexity of Legend of the Five Rings. I showed you how a simple deck can be made and the basic premises for running any deck in L5R. There's no requirement to have all the different types of cards there. There are a bunch of different options, and I think if there's anything negative that could be said about Legend of the Five Rings, is that after its return from Wizards of the Coast, there was the strangest collection of tournament rules and replacement cards. One card can substitute for another. The uh, the card game took a while to get back on its heels. In my opinion, the original card game is great um, because it was designed to be short run in the first place. And the new, the, the original stuff is good. The new stuff is very workable. If you can find Celestial Edition, it has a different format. I think the Celestial Edition uh, format is actually pretty workable too. You could uh, complain that the cards didn't have a certain power level. Like there's no first turn kills in Legend of the Five Rings. Um, when you have four provinces to get through, you can't first turn kill. You can first turn kill a province, but there's still three more to go. Now, the funny thing about Alpha Vars is all about having different options. You notice we only played with one clan, and each clan has its own different color for the personality. So there's like, there's something like nine different uh, personality backs out there, depending on which set you're in. And it allows you to have the choice of options and the choice of complexity. It does not mandate that you use that level of complexity. So I hope uh, this cleared up some things. It's, like I said, nothing's perfect. We live in a world where nothing is perfect. And L5R actually comes close to being a very good card game. So I just wanted to point out how easily one could play L5R. Um, this would apply to, this, the strategy I told you would apply to military victories and to, to honor victories. Elemental victories or enlightenment victories, that's going to require trying to get all five rings at once, and that was very rare. Most people didn't get there. This is the, the background of how to construct L5R and the general idea of how the game is set up. You can judge whether that is abominable or has its own smooth design for yourself.